بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا Welcome everybody to the Safina Saadi Nothing But Facts live stream on a Wednesday which is the anniversary of the Battle of Badr in which we will inshallah today have Sheikh Abdullah Misra on and inshallah he, he's got a new song which, which we're going to play to me it was new I didn't know it was uh, uh, that he had this but Omar, I'm sending it to you right now so you can load it up. All right, load it up when he comes on, inshallah. So uh, in the meantime, though, I want to, we want to read today the whole, um, uh, do a recitation of what happened at Badr, at the Battle of Badr. But I want to read first something that, a question that came up to me about at, al, uh, saying the word talaq, is it sufficient? And the answer to that is, in the Maliki school, the answer is yes, provided the context indicates that you want talaq. For example, saying the word talaq in this context means nothing in terms of uh, uh, implications. Okay, Saying the word talaq where there is a bisat, meaning a context, Okay, that's where um, it does count as talaq. Okay, it does count as talaq. Let me read you the concept here. Uh, if a context would indicate that. So if you need to have a context to show that you didn't mean talaq. All right. All right. So otherwise, if there is a context, such as the two people are fighting and the person says talaq, it happened. You didn't say alayk talaq or anti talaq. It's not necessary. So you're arguing, person says talaq. Yakfi. So that is the mean, meaning of wadalla al bisatu alayh or bisatun alayhi. Okay, meaning that if there is a context, okay, that would indicate that. All right. Of course, Taban. Talaq raj'i and talaq ba'in, 100%. Talaq raj'i is the first talaq and the second talaq provided there talaq is sunnah. Talaq is sunnah, which is to say it once. If you say it three times, khalas, banat min. She has to marry another man first. But you can't take her back. Or the third talaq sunnah. Talaq sunnah is to say it once. You do that three times. She is um, also batting from you. She, she has to marry another man then come back. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve guests today in the, in the live stream. MashaAllah. Ammar has bought the whole crew. The two suhaibs. <laughs> Right? And then Habib and Uga Panda and Yahya is with us today. MashaAllah. So let's talk about, let's, uh, we have a, you're studying in Tadim this, these days? And you're off? MashaAllah. And you're from Dallas? You may be the first person from Dallas to go to Tadim. Right? Yeah. Well, hopefully the beginning of many. Inshallah. Which, which part of Dallas? You went to Tadim too? For the daughter, mashallah. And which which part of uh, which part of Dallas do you live in? Plano. Plano. So that's epic. Uh, Sheikh Arsalan's masjid. Okay, yeah. Okay, mashallah. Very good. Very good. All right, Ahmed. How is? Uh, sh- um, he's ready. Good. 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 All right. Let's start with. Um, Let's start with what actually happened in the Battle of Badr. Alian, could you please me open that book to the chapter on Badr? Yeah. So today is the anniversary of the Waqiat Badr, or the actual occurrence of the Battle of Badr. And last night was the night of the Battle of Badr, meaning that last night was also extremely important because the Sahaba were extremely nervous and extremely upset uh, about the potential, not upset, I shouldn't say upset, but nervous about what is about to transpire. So much so that there is a narration from a companion said, we slept that night as if it's our last night. Like, this is our last night. And 
the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam spent the entire night in dua, in sleep. Maybe he slept only a small amount of time, uh, but he was up all night praying. And Allah Taala gives us a very simple principle about Badr. One verse we get about the lessons of Badr. وَلَقَدْ نَصَرَكُمُ اللَّهُ بِبَدْرٍ وَأَنْتُمْ أَذِلَّهُ We gave you victory at Badr while you were uh, meek. That's the principle. When you're meek, Allah sends you help. But if you're arrogant, then you get no help. That's essentially the rule of thumb. Well, uh, the battle of... Um, to, uh, the battle of... Uh, Huh? No, no. Hunain is the opposite now. Battle of Hunain was the opposite. Battle of Hunain, Ajab if Ajabatkum Kathratukum Falam Tugni Ankum in Allah Shaya. Right? You loved your your numbers, but it benefited you nothing. It didn't help you, right? It didn't free you from the enemy. So this is where it's reliance upon uh, mater- our material forces is the biggest problem. Whereas reliance upon uh, when you're meek, you can't rely on your forces, so you have to rely on Allah. What's hard now, but possible, is to have forces and rely on Allah. To have strength and to rely on Allah at the same time. And that's what many, many people have trouble to doing. So if you see these two edges, even the you have Sahaba, they saw their numbers, they didn't rely on Allah. Not that they didn't, like officially didn't rely on Allah, but internally the way that they were, and 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 many of them were new Sahabi too, literally three four days old Sahabi. So when you have, for example, half the army is from Mecca, and half the army is very uh, have this false sense of security, it impacts the whole army, right? So those new Muslims, we would attribute it to them. We don't attribute this to the veteran Sahaba because that's a, an, it would be an accusation of the Prophet's tarbiyah of them, right? The new Muslims who barely had any tarbiyah with, within Islam, they were literally days and weeks as Muslims only, they had a false sense of security. And that spread through the whole army to the point that at Hunayn, the... Uh, Opposing army, which was the people of Ta'if, the tribe of Ta'if, which is known as the Beni Thaqif, they penetrated the entire army and re- reached right in front of the Prophet ﷺ. And there the Prophet had around him his com- the, the Ahl al-Bayt. Because the Prophet used to divide up the, the army based upon uh, families to give extra motivation to fight harder. Because fighting alongside a stranger, you may not give your life for a stranger. Yes, you're supposed to be fighting for the for, for the sake of Allah. That's the initial intent. But there are multiple intentions at play here, too. And all of them are righteous. Did not the Prophet Sallallahu say, whoever is killed trying to protect himself or his wealth is a shaheed. So if I die, someone's trying to attack my brother and I uh, uh, step in front of him I and I get killed, I'm shaheed. Someone tries to steal my car and I get killed. I'm shaheed. So all these are righteous intentions. So the Prophet multiplied all these righteous intentions. So yes, you're going on jihad fi sabidillah to spread the word of Allah. But also, we're going to put you next to your family. Because you won't want your nephew to be killed. You don't want your brother to be killed. You don't want your father to be killed. So you have multiple reasons to fight harder. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, if you notice in the Fath of Mecca, the hadith of Ibn Abbas with Abu Sufyan, uh, sorry, Al Abbas with Abu Sufyan, he says that each tribe with their clan was coming with their own flag. So, like a whole clan, and they had their own personal flag, right? Their own family clan uh, flag, because they would want to protect each other at the same time. So, it's multiple good intentions here. And so, when these people arrived at the Prophet, I said, Who was there? All the Ahlul Bayt. All the Ahlul Bayt were around the Prophet. And I believe, wasn't it Zubair was amongst them? Because he is a cousin through the mother, right? He's a cousin. His mother is uh, the daughter of the Muttalib. So that's why he was there, right? So he was he is uh, related to Abdul Muttalib through the mom, through his mother. So that's essentially, that's what happened uh, at 
Al-Badr is that they didn't have any of these numbers. So Allah makes it easy for you now to rely on him because you have no choice. This is the initial reliance on Allah is when you rely on him when you have no choice. The highest reliance is to rely on him whether you have a choice or not. In other words, it were the illusion of choice. Anything else is an illusion. So it's a very lofty level that a person is at where they're completely, they, they're surrounded by the amenities of power, yet they still manage to rely solely on Allah Ta'ala. So in the Battle of Badr, they never, they didn't have anything. And the maximum that one had was a sword and a shield, maximum. And most of them had a small knife or a stick or a staff or nothing at all because they were going to, to overtake 50 to 60 merchants. They're 50 to 60 merchants. They're, they're not heavily armed. I'm sure they had arms, right? But not heavily armed. Maybe one or two of were security guards. Let's say they had 10 security guards. Well, you have 300 people, right? So they went to overtake that. And that was supposed to be a, 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 an, a, an easy job. And it was supposed to be retribution for all the wealth stolen from them, from Mecca. And the Ansar were part of it too because the Ansar are the ones helping the Muhajirs. The Ansar are the people of Medina. The Muhajirs are the people who came from Mecca to Medina. They lost all of their wealth. Now the Ansar, why are they deserving of this? They, did, they didn't get any of their wealth stolen, right? So why are they worthy of going to Badr and, and getting this caravan? The, the reason they're worthy is that didn't they support the Muhajirs when they came? Didn't they give like half their money in some cases. So the Ansar spent a lot of money on the Muhajirs. So just when you look at it as retribution, yeah, they deserve some too because they spent a lot on the Muhajirs. And so that was the initial um, uh, coming out. And you notice that there is always a mix between Deen and Dunya here, right? It's not, it is a mix between Deen and Dunya. These things overlap. It's not just one or the other. Right? And our religion is a practical religion. It's the religion that's supposed to be lived. It's not just ide lofty ideals in the, in the sky. Lofty ideals in the sky, they never work. Best example being Marxism. He has these lofty ideas in the sky. Well, two generations into, one generation into Marxism, when people don't, they're like not buying into it, Stalin had to kill everyone to make sure they buy into it. So the dean comes with a very practical um, approach to it. All right, our guest is here, Sheikh Abdullah Misra. Uh, let's bring him on. Welcome to the Nothing But Facts live stream for the second time. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you? Alhamdulillah, Dr. Shari. How are you doing? Are you back in Toronto? I am back in Toronto, yes. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Good, good. Mashallah. Very good, very good. So this is the second time you're on, but this time you're on for a different reason. You're on because you wrote a new chapter in your album. And this specifically on the Battle of Badr. So let's zoom out and share with everyone who don't know that you have a musical background and that you are the author of these, of what is going to be like a, 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 how do I put it, an epic series of poems that are singable, okay, that are also can be taught in schools and taught to people in halakas and masajid. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a mutton. So because this is a knowledge-based podcast, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, I will say that I, internally, I define it as a mutton. Mm -hmm. But it, the way it comes out in the modern world is as a nasheed or a song. Yeah. And we've always been comfortable mm. as an ummah balancing between the two of those. Yeah. So nowadays, you know, whenever in the Muslim world, whenever you say, you know, oh yeah, you know the burda? And people say, what are you talking about burda? You know, they don't know the necessarily the, the term burda, like the average Ammi Muslim. Yeah. But when you start saying, you know, Mawla ya salli wa sallim, even that's not actually part of the original burda. Yeah. When you just start saying that, they say, oh, yeah, 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 of course, of course, of course. Then they'll say, I'm into that kuri, you know, then they'll they'll say, yeah. you know. Um, and then if you tell them, you know, there are commentaries on that. Mm -hmm. That's not in their realm of, the average person just knows it's a song that can be sung in beautiful ways. And it's something you sing in a group. Um, but the tulab al are, there's commentaries on it. And they're studying it, <clears throat> every word of it, and they're using yeah. it as, <clears throat> you know, you cite it as proof sometimes. When you want istinas on some point, you say, you know, uh, some some line from the Burda. And um, it started with the Sira song for me back in 2007, 2008. <clears throat> 
from Tareem and then to Jordan. So this has been some time in the making, alhamdulillah, the idea of combining the kind of the musical background from before I was Muslim with the knowledge uh, and the and the tradition of teaching knowledge. So the Sira song is the, the, the general is about 15 chapters or 12 chapters, and that's the khulasa of the Sira, right? With with a twist. So mm-hmm. yes, it's 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 you know 13, 14 chapters, but the difference is this. Uh I have not and I'm and I'm not saying, you know, that um I thought of this, but in the English language, I don't think anyone's done a sira of the past, present, and future. So the contention is this: it's the entire sira according to the authentic kind of sources, but it also includes your future, your present relationship with the Prophet. Mm. So how are you interacting with it right now? There's a whole chapter about that. And what's he going to do for you in the future? Because only if you understand past, present, and future can you put all three together and realize no one has done more for us than Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Whereas we often think of Sira as a biography of someone who passed, lived, and passed away. Yes, yes. And, and I thought that that was not the right way to teach Sira in the modern context, which people need to know. You've got a living relationship with Rasulullah, and you haven't seen nothing yet. If you think you've done, he's done everything for you. Wait until the hereafter. So those three. That's a great point. That's a great point. And then now you're you're going to take sections from that and expand it into its own song. That's what I wanted to do. Remember, this is 15 years ago, right? Yeah. About, yeah, about 15 years ago. So I had originally thought of doing that. And so this is where the Battle of Other Song is like, you know, I did I did one, I think, uh, on Mi'raj, Isra on Mi'raj a long time ago. Um, doing a Mawlid song I would have loved to do, but it's, th- those are hard to do. Um you know, there's a lot, a lot of spiritual meanings, but not as much uh, ilmi details to yeah. unpack, right? Yeah. So the Battle of Badr was one, one where you know you have a narrative in front of you, and that narrative can be that you can say the narrative, and yeah. then also add the lessons at the end for future generations. So this is going to be very easy for kids to um, uh, have it playing constantly, and they'll memorize a sira by this. Now, that's one thing I noticed about the Bed- the Sira song that's different from the Bedr song is that the Sira song has a um, chorus to it of, of dhikr, of la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, yes. alayhi salatu. Is there the same thing for Bedr? I'm trying to think what what words can fit in there. No, so the the, 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 the Sira song, the, the Badr, uh, the, the chorus is the battle of Badr was fought on a fateful day between shirk and haq, only one can have its way. Mm. With the help of Allah, the Muslims overcame, and from that day on, everything would change. And by putting that chorus, you know, things are pro- we, we program our minds, right? right? Everything programs your mind. So the whole point of that chorus is to put in your mind what Badr stood for, and that it wasn't about, like, you know, we can say it was about, oh, you know, it was about many different aspects of, you know, anthropology. No, it was haq and batil. Yeah. Kufr, you know, iman and shirk was the most central concept. It wasn't like an economic, you know, uh, disparity, you know, and a, and a natural revolution that came out of that. Yes, that was obviously an aspect of the poor muhajirin, as you were just talking about before. Yeah. But the real thing is this idea of getting trained in your mind to realize there's there's haq and there's batil. And those two things are, they will eventually, they can live together if there's tolerance. But batil does not actually tolerate haq. Yeah. It's not the other way around, actually. Yeah. It's not the other way around. And then, then that forces oppression, which causes a clash. And when the Muslims are patient, there's an overcoming. But it's not then it's not it's there as a spiritual moral teaching, not necessarily it's not about a war teaching. Yeah. Like that's not what it's about at all. It's his, it's it's learning your history so you can be proud of it. So it's not you're you're reclaiming it rather than allowing other people to talk about it. And when we talk about the the economic element, you have to ask what was the origin of the oppression in the first place? They were not oppressing them because for no reason. They're oppressing them because of their tawheed. So the right. economic I mean, element is a branch of the tawheed, uh, uh, the yeah. haq versus batid element. Yeah, because once yeah. The, see, this is the thing. Once the tawheed is off, once you're not on tawheed, all the other oppressions stem from that. You see, all yeah. uh, all dhulm in the world comes from the greatest dhulm, right? Which is not knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your creator. Once Once that's in line, you have a hope to put everything else in place. Yeah. Right, and so yeah, all the other oppressions came out of um, out of their opposition. Out of that, and and be and if they had if they hadn't said la ilaha illallah, they would have their wealth would have been would not have been stolen, and they wouldn't have been kicked out of Mecca or expelled exactly. from Mecca. So exactly, yeah, exactly, and and this is the exact thing we repeat. Yeah. I think the reason why after 15 years, I was like, I said to Ilyas Mao, I said, you got to sing this 
First, yeah. I went in the studio to sing it. And then I was like, no, no, no. I want you to sing it and I'll yeah. back you up in the chorus. But we're going what's giving what's going on in Gaza, leaving your homes, leaving your wealth, impossible odds. This yeah. is a song for, for right now, today. Subhanallah. Yeah. Subhanallah. All right, Omar, let's take it to us. Uh, take uh, take us to it. Let's listen to it. Bismillah. Are, are we we're gonna be able to hear it here? Good. No, no, you're just gonna play this button. No, he thought you were gonna do it live. No, you're just gonna play that button. Yeah, hit the play button. All right, go. The battle of Bugger was fought on a fateful day between Shirk and Hub. Only one could have its way with the help of Allah. The Muslims overcame, and from that day on, everything would change. In the second year of Hijrah, the month of Ramadan, near the wells of the break of dawn, Muslims saw the pagans across the barren sand, driven from their homes, it was time to take a stand. Our prophet came with 313 of his best, to a thousand Meccans to put them to the test, and the fate of Islam was hanging on the line, just imagine the faith of the Muslims at this time. The battle of Badr was fought On a fateful day between Shirk and Hub Only one could have its way with the help of Allah The Muslims overcame and from that day on Everything would change Ali Hamza Ubaidah, the champions of Islam First to face the opponents with their swords in hand Stand for truth and just 
Mashallah, that is, that was beautiful. Mashallah, and is uh, let me ask you, is this on YouTube yet, or or what? It's coming out on YouTube, inshallah. I mean, the the live now. This is on YouTube, and uh, <laughs> last night celebrate mercies one is on YouTube. But our music video, it's a lyric video. It's just about to finish up. Should be out by inshallah Friday. We hope Friday, mashallah. Uh, so but, so this isn't around yet. This is just yesterday. Was the first oh. time you played it in public. Yes, that was a that was a world premiere. Ajeeb, subhanallah, this is the world premiere, and this yeah. is a gift. This is a gift to all the people on the, on the Nothing But Fa but, but Facts podcast That's, and your viewers, yeah. who I love very much, mashallah, because I love you so much. I love Allah your viewers Allah. a lot. Of, a lot of <laughs> and so they can go to if they want to download this PDF for free. It is thebattleofbrother.com. All right, let's put that. He's going to put that in right here. Get the PDF. Um, so you can follow it follow along when you when you hear it the yeah. battle of bedzer.com and eventually it's going to be on what is that going to be its own youtube channel or Ilyas no. Mao's channel no, Ilyas Mao has his channel cuz he sang the song and I'll have it on my channel as well just uh, as part of the work but yeah. you'll be able to hear the tune but in a choral singing environment like in a group singing environment yeah. and for memorization purposes you probably won't be able to imitate Ilyas Mao's version so you have to do it in an in shad uh, format. Oh, right? Which is okay, how I okay. always sang the song. I sang yeah. it in, in Shad format. And when I went to Ilyas Mal, he did a professional, like a kind of artistic format. Yeah. So if you want to, when you get that PDF, you can you can share it with all the Islamic schools and halakas and everything, families, and then you know sing it together as a group. For example, tell us a bit about uh, Ilyas Mal. Is he from Minnesota or is he from Toronto or? <laughs> he said, <What? laughs> "No, no, he's from Tor he's he's from Guelph. It's a it's a small town outside of uh, Toronto, um, and uh, yes, he's of some Somali heritage, mashallah. So yeah. he's a he's you know because I have the artistic side and the kind of you know the you know imam scholarly side, but I like I get along a lot with the people of art, to be yeah. honest with you. Yeah. And and so you know he just became a friend, and I went to um, record uh, some of my own nasheeds, uh, my other nasheeds with my own voice, and then I said, look." I got Zain Bika to do Sira song because he was the right voice to deliver that song. And I said, I want this song. I want you to try it. And, you know, in the beginning, it's like, you know, what is it really? I don't know. And then he got it. He fell in love with it. And then one night in Ramadan last week, we just, I came after prayers. I just came over there and we just stayed up all night and I'm just listening to him. I'm just kind of guiding him on how to, you know, what this means and how to, how to do this. And here's the emotion. So I would actually walk him through the emotion of the song, how I intended it. And he's a spiritual singer himself. And I like that. I like to choose Nasheed singers who are spiritual, mashallah, he's vocal only. So all the, the sounds that you heard, the marching is, is, is uh, you know, uh, everything is vocal, you know. So the horses, the hooves of the horses, um, that's, all, that's all vocal or natural sounds. Mashallah, good. So... So he is a Toronto native, and that's uh, that's basically how you know him. Who came up with the melody, you or him? No, I came up with the melody 15 years ago. The melody oh, in the wow. whole song was there. Yeah, yeah. So I came Subhanallah. up with the whole song and the melody. I went to record it myself, and I said, "Why don't you try it?" Now his voice is of a higher pitch than mine. Yeah, and he's a he's a genius at mm. producing, and so he was able to do the vocal layers and. And for Baraka, add me to the chorus as well, mashallah. And so, yeah, yeah he made it special. Alhamdulillah. That's really good, really good. Now let's talk about the battle. And I want to talk about, uh, similar to what I talked about yesterday in Celebrate Mercy, there is, there is a mental element to this yeah. battle. And there was a there was an optimism given to the Muslims, and there was a tashaum that many people don't know about that was given to the kuffar. The mm -hmm. tashaum, the bad news or the bad omen, was the dream of the prophet's aunt. SubhanAllah, yes, yes. The prophet's aunt had a dream. And she had a dream in which a man came down. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, in this dream, man came into Mecca and slit the nose of a camel. And then began shouting, uh, a calamity has come. Halak, yeah, halak, yeah. And then destruction. They're saying the word destruction. Then he went to the other side and he did the same thing until he did it all around the city of Mecca. Okay. At that point, she told her uh, Al-Abbas 
her, his, her brother, Al Abbas. And Al Abbas then said, don't tell anyone okay, this dream. At this point, nothing has happened. There's no word, no news of a Muslim uh, army coming or anything. And so, of course, like these things, it, word spread. By the middle of the day, Abu Jahl was saying, Abbas, what's going on? You have another prophet in your family? Right? You have another one telling the future in your family? He says, Abbas, uh, if, if you don't, if this doesn't come true, your, your whole family will be stamped liars to us. Because now you're, you, okay, for your first, your, your nephew, we didn't believe him in the first place. And now um, your aunt, is, your, your sister is saying this. So Abbas says he spent the whole day, the next two days in his house, very upset. Very upset at what Abu Jahl just said to him, first of all. But also very upset at the whole situation. On the third day, a man comes into the city with news that your caravan is about to be overtaken. And so they had this negativity, this tasha'um. That this is what I want to point to: the mental element when you go into battle of optimism or negativity. And you see that although the power dynamic was off, then the 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 mental uh, plane was also off in reverse. Mm -hmm. So, what's the opposite now for the Muslims? This is the numbers every Muslim's got to remember because people get these confused. Allah promised. The Sahaba, a thousand angels will support you. That one should be enough, right? One angel can destroy a whole city. As Sayyidina Jibreel was at, when the Prophet asked him, how do you destroy a city? He said, I put it on the tip of my wing, showed the malaika, and then flipped it. That's how simple it is. A city, not an army. So a thousand angels, then 3,000 angels, then 5,000 angels. So it's different upon whether it's 5,000 total or 9,000 total. Sheikh, what have you heard about that between one thousand total or five thousand or nine thousand? Yeah, so this is the, this is the thing. You know, there'll be there'll be differences of opinion if whether Allah is saying I'm going to you know umditkum uh, like I'll increase you, so I'll add the increment to make it a total, yeah. or is yeah. it that this then this then this? And the whole point is it's kathra, kathra. because at, at the yeah. end of the day, uh, I mean, I'm not saying like that's the the right answer, but the point is you feed al kathra. It's like so much yeah. that. As you said, one angel can destroy an entire city or the world even. Yeah. And uh, and then it's important to realize as well that although there were, when the angels came down, and Jibreel alayhi salam is described as riding on a piebald horse, mm. and they have steeds in multicolored turbans, Musa we mean, they're, they're marked with the marks of turbans, and they're swooping down, and, you know, the Prophet uh, uh, Jibreel alayhi salam, he's spurring on his steed. I believe he called it Jehun, if I'm not mistaken. He said he was saying, you know, onward. And the heads of the kuffar would just be like rolling off their bodies here and there, right? Some of them would just be struck dead. And, you know, one of the Sahabi was trying to pursue one of the Meccans after overpowering him, and, and the man dropped right in front of him. And he couldn't even see what happened. But the angels did not come to fight, actually. They mm. came to strengthen the, the believers. SubhanAllah. Because when you're when you're in a scrap with a bully and your big brother comes in, you just you just get that little extra bit of you know yeah. jolt of confidence. So Support. actually the job was done by the believers. It was not done by the angels. The angels just came to make them realize mm. don't think you're alone. SubhanAllah. And the and that's why the uh, the the support comes in waves. So one the first announcement was a thousand angels. The next announcement, three thousand angels. Next announcement, 5,000. So when it comes in, in numbers like this or in, in waves like this, each time it strengthens your morale. Each time you feel more and more supported. And that's one of the uh, signs of the sunan of Allah Ta'ala is that he gives something in different amounts, not all at once. Because all at once, you're just going to get good news once. Whereas if it comes in parts, you get good news multiple times, you end up being on a roll. Right. right. And also, advantage. as the battle gets heavier and thicker, the amount of sabr required, steadfastness required, increases. So, sabat, you know, when you're looking across from each other, it's one thing. It's a war of nerves. Then you get into the hand-to-hand. -hand. Then you get in. And then it really starts to, you know, uh, you know, enmesh. And that's the hardest part because this battle, you know, when I ask people about the battle, what's the hardest part of this battle? They say, oh, it was the first time. Mm. Or um, it, they were very small in numbers. Or you know they, they weren't well equipped. They were scared. They were oppressed. Actually, I don't personally think, and, I, and and Allah knows best. I don't think that was the hardest thing about this battle. 
It was mm. not the numbers. It was not the hardest thing of the battle. It was that you looked across the other side and you saw your dad on the other side. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. You saw your brother on the other side, mm. eye to eye. And, you know, you, they came at each other. You know, like they came at each other and there were cases where they had to fight and, you know, finish one another. And people saw their own flesh and blood for the first time. It's very easy to face an enemy you don't know. But the Quraysh were after their own family members. That's why in the hand-to-hand -hand combat, initially, when, you know, Sheba and Utbah, when they come out to challenge from the Quraysh, and the Muslims, the three Ansar jumped out right away. Mm. They, they loved the Prophet so much. Even so, though they did not promise to go out and fight for him. They promised to defend him. So they didn't have to go. So, But three Ansar jumped out right away to, to, to challenge them. But what did the Quraysh say? They said, Akifa kiram. Look how much respect the Arabs had, even as enemies. They said, you are our match, and you are honored people. Respectable, honored people, and our match. Akifa kiram. kiram. Mm. But we want our kin. Send our blood. This is about us and our family. We have a bone to pick. Don't give us the Ansar. We have no problem with you. And that's where the Prophet Wasallam. this is the test. Look at this. If you had to pick three people to fight, you might pick, uh, you know, three people, three people you're not related to. Why would you pick your, your own uncle, your own cousin? Because the sacrifice was on Rasulullah Sallam the most. That's why he said, Ali, Hamza, Ubaidah. Mm. That's why they went out, knowing that your own flesh and blood, he started with them. Because you're watching them hand-to-hand -hand combat. Everyone's watching. One man survives, one dies. That was the whole miracle of this battle. Yeah. Right? No wonder yeah. angels came down. You're, you're willing to go against your flesh and blood for the haq? Subhan Allah sends Allah. angels so tell me which uh, Sahabi had a, bro a father or a brother or a son. Let's they start were, from the all top. Of them, actually, all of them, yeah. So all of them had, right? So um, look, look, let's look at the stories. Abu Ubaidah, it's, it's narrated in his, his, his biography. <clears throat> Abu Ubaidah, Amr ibn al-Jarrah, one of the ten promised paradise. Um, there was a man in a helmet that constantly was pursuing him on the battlefield. And he kept on avoiding to fight that person and go somewhere else but this person kept on finding him and striking at him finally had no choice but to put him down when he took off the helmet it was his own father subhanallah subhanallah so abu abeda what he did for the rasul sallallahu and for deen is actually had to do that to his own father al jarrah after, himself mm. yeah years mm. after when abu bakr and his uh, his son became muslim i forget i think i believe his i forget his abdul rahman or muhammad but yeah. I think it was Abdul Rahman, if I'm not mistaken. His son became Muslim and said, you know, Dad, that day, according to the reports, that day I saw you on the battlefield, but I just avoided you out of respect for you. And Abu Bakr said, what? If I would have seen you, I would have gotten to you first. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Um, Musab ibn Umair, his brother passed away in that. I mean, there were Sahabi. Remember when, because the bodies were thrown into the wells. The bodies of the mushrikeen, when they died, 70 of them, they were thrown into the wells. And the... The uh, I believe it was Hanvala, who else was it? That there were some Sahabi that were just looking downcast because they're seeing mm. their the bodies of their own family members who tried to kill them. Who were killed by and the Prophet came and he comforted them. He's like, I know how hard this is to look at your family member. Like, why didn't you just say? And they're saying, Why didn't you just say La ilaha illallah? Why didn't you just say it? You know? And so the Prophet comforted them, but what it did was it made the connection of Iman. Stronger than the connection of blood. You know, they say blood mm. is thicker than water. Yeah. Iman is thicker than blood. Right? So now they're saying, you gave up all these things. That's when the Sahaba really became a unit with Rasulullah Yeah. Because you're willing to go against your people. That's it. You're in it with the Prophet for good. Now. Tell us about the time afterwards the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam laid the leaders out. Who did he lay out? The leaders, everybody, and spoke to them. So what he did initially was when he got on the battlefield, he pointed out the masra of every single of every single person when they were where they would fall. Mm. The Ashraf al Quraysh. So he walked around and he said, when he he said, This person's gonna fall here, this person's gonna fall here, this person's gonna fall here. And the battlefield's blank, it's empty. Mm. And then when he act when the when the battle when the when the when the sides came out and he saw who was standing there, Umayyah Umay bin Khalaf, Abu Jahl. Like they brought all of their top people out. Only Abu Sufyan was not there. And uh, um, of course, Abu Lahab wasn't there because he didn't want to attend. So he sent someone in place and he was older anyways. But Abu Sufyan was with the caravan. So it's very lucky Abu Sufyan wasn't there that day. Maybe that's mm. why Hidayah was written for him. SubhanAllah. Right? Hidayah yeah. was written for him later. 
But then the Prophet Sallallahu when he saw which Quraysh had come out, he's like, these are, this is not your scrappers. These are your... And he said, oh, Muslims, the Quraysh has thrown out its liver. Like, it's given out all of its most valuable people. Yeah. These are the people, right? And this is where, subhanAllah, where Abu, Abu, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf was standing beside, you know, in the battle lines, standing beside these two young boys, right? And these, the, like, two teenagers, you could say. And the teenagers said, uncle, show us. One of them says, uncle. Which one is Abu Jahl? Mm. And he said, why do you want to know who Abu Jahl is? And he said, because I heard he disrespected the Rasul Sai someone. And he said, oh, all right, fine. He's that one over there. Because these are unsorry boys. They've never seen the, 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 the Quraysh before. And the other side, he, he said, uncle, psh, uncle, yeah. Which one is Abu Jahl? Show me. And he's like, oh, brave. What are you going to do about that? He's like, oh, that, he, he disrespected Rasul Sai someone. He said, okay, it's that one over there. And he was saying that I was so unconfident that I had two teenagers beside me. Right? So you, want, you want strong people beside you. He says those two people ran like hawks straight towards Abu Jahl. And they're the ones Subhanallah. Right? And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when all when all the all was laid out, he was addressing them. And he was saying that, you know, you know, the promise of Allah we have found has come true. Have you now found the promise of Allah to come true or not? And this is where the Sahaba asked, Oh Rasulullah, you're speaking to dead people. Mm. Like, well, why are you doing that? But of course, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never does anything with Abbas, not like Hasha, right? That he does anything that is useless. So he said, no, no, they can hear me just as well, but you perceive it not. So to the near meaning. Hmm. Teaching us a, 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 not a aqida point, but it's a point of a point of the unseen. The nature of the creation. And uh you mentioned that they they the Prophet Sallallahu said they've brought out their their livers, meaning they brought out yeah. their best, they all of their big leaders are here. Yeah, and yeah. That the livers are, yeah. Is one of possibly one of the wisdoms that they 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 were so meek. The three hundred were so meek that the leaders felt, oh, this is easy pickings, right? There's no risk for us here, right? It was supposed to be a cakewalk. That's why Abu yeah. Jahl said, if we go there and they don't show up to fight, because they actually thought the Muslims wouldn't show up to fight. Yeah, they said we're still gonna camp at Badr for three days. We're gonna drink. We're gonna make merry, and our girls are gonna dance. Save girls are gonna dance for us. We're just gonna so, have a festival. So yeah. that's their mindset. Yeah, is yeah. they're coming to have a, a drunken party. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the Muslims are coming for survival. Look at the yeah. two different mindsets. No wonder yeah. things 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 took place. And you know about the rainfall that took place as well, right before, mm -hmm. you know, that the natural the natural signs as well. The rain comes right before the battle to firm up the earth mm -hmm. on the side of the Muslims. Because yeah. you know, when you run in sand, run on the beach, mm -hmm. it's tired, very, very yeah. tired. Your, your feet are sinking in and everything. And the Muslims had only two horsemen compared to uncountable on the other side. Two mm. horses. And so, the, but the rain on the other side made it difficult for them. Made it sli like, you know, muddy and slimy and for the other Sahaba. And they slept the entire night with a full sleep. SubhanAllah. How do you do that the yeah. night before a battle? Yeah. Sakina comes down. Hmm. Uh, what, tell us about the parallels between this and David and Goliath. SubhanAllah. This is, this is more epic than David and Goliath. Hmm. This is more, there's no doubt about that. I mean, with all due respect to uh, Prophet Dawood, which is an amazing thing. But remember, with that, it was this idea of, you know, proving who Dawood is to everyone. But he didn't mm. have a personal stake in fighting the Philistine uh, uh, Jalut, Goliath. He didn't have a personal stake in it. And he used his his sling, according to how the stories go, and, uh, you know, slew, slew uh, Goliath and showed that he has a, a wider range of Tawfiq and strategy and thinking than what is there. That was that was amazing. Mm -hmm. But the promotion that he got was that he kind of rose up in the ranks, right? With Saul, the army of Saul. Now, that being said, Battle of Badr is the same thing. It's David against Goliath, but it's even more than that because you've taken every single thing from these people. Mm. And your own family members are against you. And it's actually because of your iman itself. So it's not just a clash because two civilizations are really close to each other. Okay, it's not just because like they're, 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 it's tribal warfare here. It's not. It's it's one tribe. Yeah, we call it Quraysh, but we don't realize the Quraysh were on the other side too. Yeah, the Muslims mm -hmm. were Quraysh, right? Half yeah. of them, right? So the, then, uh, entire civilizations were born out of these two, right? The, yeah. Out of the after David and Goliath's battle. Yeah, yes. it took some time, but eventually, Satan the Dawood became king. After yeah. ten years, he became king. Yes. Right? Uh, and then a whole new era was opened up for them. But it really started with that battle. Same you could say about the Battle of Badr, 
right? At, right after that, you could really start to tell that there's going to be a line in the sand here, and eventually one of the one is going to overtake the other. Right, exactly. And so, it, it, so right from that battle alone, it just it just changed everything. That's why I say, uh, and from that day on, everything would change because from that day on, the Muslims no longer saw themselves as weaklings. Yeah. As meek weaklings, because remember, before that time, they had been commanded as while they were citizens in Mecca, they were not allowed to physically resist. The mm. Prophet mm. would walk by uh, Ammar ibn Yasser and his family being tortured, and he wouldn't like come in and start like you know they could have done that, but he yeah. said no. He said, he had to exhort them to patience. Mm -hmm. And once Saad ibn Abi Waqqas, who was 18 years old and became Muslim, he took a jawbone of a camel and he hit one of the Quraysh over the head made him bleed. So right. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he forbade him from doing that. He said, what do you think? Mm. Like, you know, this is not what we're doing. So they only did that once they were a polity on their own. And that way, you know, they had the, they had the full right, you know, morally, legally, spiritually to resist this type of thing as a polity mm. that's separated. There was no, there was no ghadr. There was no ghadr or like yeah. betrayal in it. Uh, who were, who were taken as captives? We know the story about that there were captives taken then uh, there was a debate on what to do with the captives, but who were the? Do we know who the captives were? There were seventy. So there was. They say seventy were killed. Seventy were taken captive. Of course, the number seventy in Arabic denotes plenty, right? Mm -hmm. A lot. And we know that the night, that night that passed, those captives. Again, you're binding. Subhanallah. I believe it was Musab ibn Umair who walked by and saw his own brother was captive. Was it Musab or something? I forget who it was. And he said he looked at his captor, and his brother said, "You know, you're going to free me, right? I'm your brother." And he said to the Muslim brother who's capt captured him, he said, tie his bonds really tight. Oh. You know, his, his brother has a lot of means to, to get him free. SubhanAllah. But he, he was showing, no, you're my brother. I'm soft towards you. But now you came out to kill people. You came out to fight him. No, mm. now this is... But look on the other side. Look at the softness. Rasulullah in the night, in his tent, he hears the moans and the, 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 the groans of his uncle Abbas who's, whose bonds are too tight. Mm, he can hear it. You know, he's here because he's, 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 he's his uncle, his elder yeah. to him by a few years. And he's hearing somebody go, oh, oh, you know. Well, you know, Abbas just came out. He didn't come out because he wanted to fight the Muslims. In fact, some ulama say he was a Muslim even from that time. Some say it was Am Am Fat. Okay. Mm. Mm. But the point was he came out because he had to come out because the whole society was saying, all right, all right now where, where do you stand on this, right? So he came out almost like in, in, in out of shame that he had to, to go there. Obviously, he's not trying to fight. And so he's, he, his bonds are too tight. Someone tied them too tight. So the Prophet couldn't sleep because he heard the groans of his uncle from his tent. And he asked the Sahabi, can you please loosen his bonds? And he, still, he, he asked. And they loosened the bonds of Abbas because he knows he's not one of those people who's um, a betrayer or against the Muslims. The Prophet, as we know, subhanAllah, the most emotional one that you know and I know. Is that the Prophet Sallallahu own son-in-law was taken mm. as a captive? Mm. His own son-in-law was taken as a captive, and we know the story that as um, all of the Sahaba, so they decided what to do. I'll give you a pause for this. They said, should we execute or should we free them? Should we ransom them? What should we do? And the Prophet Sallallahu made you know made mashura with different people. Of course, Omar then was like, execute them. Abu Bakr mm -hmm. was like, you know, ransom them. And so what they decided on was a ransoming. Because at the end of the day, what did they need? They didn't need at the they didn't need they didn't need to show, you know, they felt they didn't need to execute them. What they needed to do, right? And it's your own family members after all. What they needed to do was they needed wealth to be able to eat, mm -hmm. right? So it's better to just give back the money, they give it a ransom each person tried to, to extinguish us. We'll let them go. You know, you obviously you, you, there's an impl implication. You're not going to come back and do that again. And those who cannot afford to do so must teach ten uh, children of the Ansar how to read. Ch ten mm. of the Muslim children or people mm. who cannot read how to read. And that was the most poignant part of this ransom. That it was education the mm. Prophet them wanted because he knew the Quraysh were some of them were educated, mm -hmm. right? And so you know what happened. Yeah, go on, Bismillah. MashaAllah. So, yeah, so it was ransom with money or by educating. Tali, that's right. Tell us about Abbas. Uh, maybe some people don't know that what his situation was with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that he was almost like the Prophet's inside man in Mecca. Yeah. And it's unknown whether or not he officially became Muslim or he was. The Prophet knew that he was a believer in him by his actions. So tell us a yeah. little bit about that. And also, what does that imply in fiqh? 
regarding hiding your belief if you're going to help somebody? Yeah, this is a very, very good point. So the Prophet I mean, Abbas was his uncle technically, but he was only a few years older than him. Just like Hamza was also just a few years older than him. He had young uncles, in other words, because mm. his father, Abdullah, they were 10 brothers. So some of the, the, the brothers, you know, uh, were very young. So the uncles were were very not much older than him so now what happens is uh abbas was the one at the bayat of aqaba at the pledge of aqaba when the ansar were first introduced to rasulullah for the first time who took him around to all those tribes abbas mm. who told the ansar when they were pledging to the prophet sallam, that we will protect you who said to them make sure you know what you're doing don't pledge if you don't know what you're t- telling my nephew like be yeah. true to what you're saying so uh, abbas was definitely there from the beginning you know, and he wasn't even uh, actually like Abu Talib, because uh, Abu Talib was given a clear choice, you know, by the Quraysh. Do you accept this message of your nephew or on the deen of Abdul Muttalib, as they say, as a way of saying generally the way of the Arabs? And so that was a different thing. But Abbas always kept it. It was like so unclear. Mm. And we don't know. We don't exactly know. Was it that he was a secret believer and that later on he just came out? which is most likely the, the, the case, right? Uh, and then he came out at the year of Fath because it was safe for him to come out. He was an older person to begin with. Mm. He had family members. Maybe, we don't know. Maybe there was a the threat to his family or maybe he just was not ready to make that break. But the Prophet Sallallahu did let him go for that time, meaning he did not, he said, you know, he welcomed him when he came at the Fath, even though he didn't come all those years. And did he, Is it did the Prophet, peace be upon him, try to or ask the companions to avoid him at the battle of Badr or no I didn't hear that mm-hmm. uh, Allahu alam you can you, uh, you can remind me mm-hmm. but I don't recall hearing the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, give a special instruction have you heard a special instruction I, I I did but I can't remember exactly did it come you know with the sound uh, uh transmission or can't remember the nature of the transmission Yeah or was it more like I, I have to yeah, I think something is coming back to my memory like not to uh, Void, but just say, hey guys, he's coming out. He doesn't mean to be there. There's a, there's a, a kind of a difference between saying, don't do this, and yeah. saying, saying, listen, just letting you guys know he's coming out, but he's not one of the ones. He's not fighting one of them. So I, 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 I recall that. Yeah. yeah. But um, we have to check, as with everything. And Prophet Musa, alayhi salam, there was, he had a believer in the midst of Fir'aun who would yeah. give him information. Prophet, uh, the, the Messenger, alayhi salam, has at Abbas. So. Yes. Do you remember what exactly what pieces of information at Abbas would leak to the Prophet peace be upon him? I don't want to say and get it wrong. We'll, yeah. we'll check the books inshallah. Yeah, yeah. But but Al Abbas was one of those who uh, the you you get the sense that he is with the Prophet peace be upon him, but on the other side, and as you said, the proof of that is that who was the one who arranged the Hijrah of the Prophet peace be upon him or arranged yeah. the meetings. And was there, and I remember reading in the Sirah. Hold on, when I was young, isn't Abbas not a Muslim? Why is he there speaking to defend the Prophet at Bayat al Aqaba one and two? Right, right, exactly. So the the the, the, the this is why, with specifically the Ahl Bayt, you cannot touch them in terms of start judging them on the standards of everybody else. It's yes. such a complex relationship. Mm-hmm. And such a deep, we can't get, it's like, you know, just like you can't get involved in someone else's family matters. It's like, yeah. you, you have to leave it to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah and his Rasul Sallallahu Because yeah. even with Abu Talib, there's the questions, you know, that come up. Abbas is the one who said, right? In the hadith, that I heard your, ne- your, your uncle say the words that you wanted him to say. So says, I cannot bear witness to him. Mm. I have not heard myself. Mm. So th- there's a com- there's a layer of complexity in it. Yeah. And it's better that we just don't, you know, we leave it right there. But yeah. we know that the loyalty of Abbas was with the Rasul so whether he's a full believer or not or it's coming around or there's some plan Allah, Allah yeah. we, there's no blame on there's no blame and it's irrelevant anyway since it happened right it happened and the, and you know what, yeah. what's well, you know what ends well what is it? all is well that ends well so he yeah, came out at and he's yeah. also the one that takes uh, Abu Sufyan and basically becomes like his like conductor as he brings Abu Sufyan into mm-hmm. Islam He's the yeah. one who told Abu Sufyan, become Muslim. What's wrong with you? Right? Yeah. And so, subhanAllah, and the first person whose uh, interest collections are wiped off is, is, is Abbas. Mm, so, mm. How, would, how would you just take away someone's money unless you knew yeah. they, are, they are in it? Subhanallah. You know? 
subhanAllah. So. so to clarify for those who may not know that when the Prophet, peace be upon him, banned interest and rendered riba to be haram, he applied it to his own family, the, the, the deadee. In other words, the one who benefited from interest most, right? And so uh, he cleared the debt of anyone who owed interest to Abbas. You have to pay back the capital, but the interest, so Abbas doesn't gain any more from the loans that he had put out. All he's going to get back is the original money. And so that's another example where the Prophet ﷺ begins the Sharia with his own family. Mm-hmm. He begins it at Badr. He begins it with this riba. He begins it, uh, what's another example? The da'wah itself, the invitation itself, begins with his family. Uh, but that was fine. There's no sacrifice there. There's no hardship there. But in matters of hardship, you see that the Prophet always began with his own family. All right. Always his own family. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much for coming on. F- final question. So Friday is the release of this on YouTube. We're waiting for, so here's what's happening. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'll just give you guys a sneak peek. We, we, we wanted to do an AI video. An AI, AI video. music wow. video. Yeah, mm. an AI music video. So we spoke, to, we spoke to someone who is really good at AI, but the problem is right now the field of AI, it, you give it instructions and it kind of makes a mid-journey type of, you know. Yeah, with no video. fingers and stuff, yeah. <laughs> no, but some of it is really cool. Yeah. But me and Ilyas, our concern was, does it, does it cross any lines in Ta'zim of the Sahaba? So we don't want any faces shown. Yeah. We don't want any, any and and anachronisms because an AI model yeah. will not be able. So we're t- we're tweaking it. We're we, you know so there's like work we made to do a lyric video and put it out. So it's coming up very soon. But whatever yeah. it is, inshallah, hope you'll enjoy it. So it's pictures. It we're we're decide, we're debating if it's if it if we cannot keep it within the bounds of Talim, then yeah. we will just go with the lyric video. That's just to give you a little background. But inshallah, yeah. expect something nice inshallah very soon. That's really inshallah. neat. All right, thank you so much for coming on. Jazakallah khairan. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Barakallah. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you. Jazakallah khairan. So AI, you can do short clips now, right? In AI? Like maybe three-second clips? Four-second clips? Really? Ajeeb. How long could the clips be? Hmm. I think what he said by anachronistic is, for example, you may have a scene in the desert from 500 years ago, but you might find like someone carrying a cell phone. Right, that's what I think. I think he meant by that. Anachronistic means it's the his, the the realism is off because of the AI. At this point, maybe they haven't really figured out that you know certain things don't belong in certain other areas. But what uh, what would you? I wouldn't use it. For what reason? Because um, I think you have to you have to look at things outside the art. Yeah. Right. Um, is this mic on, Omar? <laughs> This gentleman's mic. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of discussion in the uh, creative arts communities yeah. about the fear of AI taking over. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the consumers also, or the audiences, are rejecting AI for the most part right now. Right now. So if you're trying to convey this message and people pick up on the fact that it's an AI rendered model or video, yeah, there's a good likelihood they'll reject the entire But project. why would they reject that rather than like a cartoon? Oh, no, they reject the cartoons too. They're completely rejecting Why? because they feel that it's 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 not it's actually taking the place of an artist livelihood. Mm. Because what's happening is that so many artists, you know, yeah. they feel like first of all they're taking the the human expression out of the equa- equation, but then number two, they're taking away the livelihood of so many people. So it's mm. this push pull. So for me, I wouldn't do it just because I feel that. Um, so if that's, you're trying to, if, it, if it's for dawah yeah. and you're trying to connect with general audiences or people outside the Muslim community, uh, I've even had people complain about art. We had some AI artwork on our website, yeah, and artists said they refused to work with us. So maybe that's an internal thing. It's it's pretty. Uh, it's and pretty. and isn't that aren't we Muslims always blamed? They said <laughs> you Muslims did not allow the printing press <laughs> because the Turkish calligraphers were so. You know, uh, such a strong... The Turkish calligraphy is the best. There's a saying. The Quran was revealed in Hijaz, recited in Egypt, written in Turkey. Written in Istanbul, right? But that's a saying. Because the best, obviously, was revealed in Hijaz. The best reciters are, at least, you know, in the recent history has been Egyptians. Abdul Basit and those, right? Stuff Ismail and those. And then the best calligraphy 
is out of Turkey. There's no doubt about that. Look at those Ottoman masajids. So when the printing press came, who stopped it? The Turkish calligraphers. Like, oh, we're out, we're out of business if you got this. And then they did come up with a fatwa that can't do it for the Quran haram or any book of knowledge that has the name of Allah because the nature of the printing press would bang. Mm. It was like an old typewriter, right? So like, oh, you bang in the name of Allah, can't do it, right? <laughs> Kept their jobs, right? <laughs> Same with the car industry today. They're, they had to resist uh, electric cars, right? But now they can't resist it anymore. But Omar is pulling up some AI video. I can't believe this. Look, look, this is what the guy said. I can't believe this is AI. I can't, oh, yeah. yeah, I can't believe this is AI. Some of the stuff that he's putting on here, maybe you could share it real quick with everyone. Are you sure this is AI or partially AI? No, this is fully AI. Put it up on the screen so everyone can see what we're talking okay. about. Oh, I, I, we need that. <laughs> we need that little Safina Society one right there. Oh, we need that. Got coffee, got Safina's right there. Can you can you play that for everyone right there? We might get copyrighted. We might get copyrighted. Oh, we might get copyrighted because uh, every time we play a YouTube video, uh, we get copyrighted. This is, uh, uh, for everyone watching, we're, we're watching Introducing Sora, OpenAI's YouTube page, Introducing Sora, and they're giving you the best examples. You know, when I see these things, to be honest, when I go on, I get junk, right? I'm like, what, ad what are you guys advertising, right? Because every time I've tried to use AI, and they, the website advertises that this is what their images look like. And I'm like, okay, give me a ship in water. I get the worst picture possible. So I don't know. Go back to those puppies. Oh, wow. It's one of those British converts right there. <laughs> right? This guy is probably the Murabitun. All right. <laughs> So we're we're watching the the oh, introducing Sora video. Um, I gotta say that I would not have to, said right away that this is AI. If you showed me, I thought I thought it's actual puppies playing in the snow. It's puppies playing with this in the snow. A guy sitting on a bus, a spaceship movie. But the Soheib is saying the arts community is dead against open AI, and reason being is that. When Disney made would would make cartoons, you employed someone to draw the cartoon. So now I'm going to ask you a question. When um, Pixar came around and Steve Jobs came around, and even before Steve Jobs, I think animation was not by cartoons. It was like computerized. No, actually Steve Jobs fully computerized it with Pixar. And then uh, the rival of Pixar was, was um, what's his face? Sp Spielberg and Cats. SKG Dream DreamWorks. There's like three guys that rivaled. You know, Steve Jobs like crushed so many industries and created new industries. He is the guy behind Pixar. Like he didn't do. He didn't. Um, he's the guy behind Pixar. He's the one who drove it. And when he refused to, then he did he go with Disney or he refused to sell to Disney? No, he refused to sell to Disney. So the Disney guys said, "Let's open our own one." Right. DreamWorks, if I got the history right. So DreamWorks and Pixar were the rivals. But Pixar was the driver. DreamWorks was, let's rip them off like Microsoft, right? <laughs> Ripped off Apple. Way back in the 80s, Apple came out with the first computer where you don't see a bunch of text. You see files, right? You click on the file, you get the thing, and you drag into the file and all that. So that was called, what did they call that? The user interface, right? Yeah, user interface. He's the first one with the graphic user interface, GUI. Then Bill, he, he hired Bill Gates to write the software for him. But Bill Gates, that little snake was moving in his brain, <laughs> right? <laughs> so he goes out <laughs> and he copies it. <laughs> but he copies an interface that's not connected to a computer. Anyone who makes a computer could buy my interface. So he creates Microsoft Windows. Where originally he was just supposed to make the software for, for, for Apple. Okay. So Jobs comes up with the idea. Bill Gates comes and, and makes himself a, a copy of the idea and actually does better than him. Right. At that time. Same thing. Pixar comes around. This technology comes around. Uh, Steve Jobs jumps on it, takes it full force. 
and then the, uh, the DreamWorks guys come around to basically do the same thing, something similar. So wouldn't we say the same thing? When the Pixar guys came around, these guys have never picked up a crayon in their life, right? <laughs> All they're doing is pumped down on the computer, moving computers around. They've never picked up a sketch pad in their life, yet they're making better movies than the guys who's got arthritis from making so many cartoons, Right? If a cartoon does this, that's like a three days work, right? Just think about it. It's crazy how much work goes into it. So did they have a fight? Was there a fight when Pixar came out? The cartoonists must have been like, we're done with, right? The pro computer programmers have taken over our jobs. Well, I, I think it's, uh, it's going to be an interesting discussion over the yeah. next couple of years, and maybe it's inevitable, but I think that... Uh, you know, it's also about the nature of storytelling in general, what you want storytelling to be. Because the way we enjoy stories in general, it's it's a communal experience. It's a sharing of narratives. Mm -hmm. So if I, you know, it all started even, you know, before anything was ever written down, it was an oral tradition. So there's this, there's this human dynamic element in there, which is me sharing something with you. Yeah. And so if I'm putting prompts into a you know, a piece of software, to, a piece of technology, and it's producing something, it's, it's going to take a lot of that out of the equation. So I think what you're going to see ultimately is you're going to see uh, storytelling change because before it was me sharing a story with someone who's listening or watching. Mm -hmm. Now with AI, what I think you're going to see is you're going to see people becoming part of the story actually themselves because ultimately in the end, if I can tell any story I want or I can produce anything I want, then I don't need to have the storyteller. Mm. I'm part of the story because I'm creating the story myself. Mm. So I think that for many people, that's a scary notion when there's so much change. And then yeah. obviously you're right. People have to learn and relearn. But if you go back to, like you said, the Ottomans and the Gutenberg press, yeah. it was about 300 years. It was banned. And so one of the rationales behind that was so that people could get up to speed over time so they could get accustomed to, the technology yeah. because when something emerges so quickly it's not good it's not good because something yeah. you know and it's just a shock it's a shock and you need time to uh, for people to get acclimated so i think with this the only reason i'm bringing it up and i say i wouldn't do it necessarily is because i think in the micros uh, you know in the in the microcosm or in this time period right now where it's not been embraced yeah i don't know if we want to be at the forefront of what's already seen to be something that's uh negative it's, yeah you know yeah. not just from the arts community but also from anybody who's in any space if you're in the legal field if you're in i mean they're saying okay you don't need we don't need attorneys anymore either because they can read these briefs they can write you know no that's that's a problem so anything that requires a judgment and caution and people's going to lose a trial or something like that's an issue so ai i think right now it's it's yeah. it's kind of seen that there's a stigma attached to that it's the cheap and easy way out that you're using to try to do something yeah and you're, and you're hurting someone's uh, livelihood. But you, chances are people who are going to use AI couldn't afford those artists in the first place. This is true. Yeah. That's so, why with leveling of the playing field, it will happen to yeah. some degree. Um, it leveled the playing field. I'm sure that when um, the first printer, consumer-based printer, was, was invented, a lot of, you know, the authors were, a lot of book publishers were like, hold on a second, is exactly. this a problem or what? Because the only way you can get a book is through, you know, through them. Bassem says here something. He says, um, there was a similar standoff when photographers and Photoshop mm. came up decades ago. And photographers, ah, this is not real f photography, whatever. But now most photographers will edit their pictures through Photoshop, right? So... Um, Technology is a problem for, for people if they're entrenched in a certain skill and the technology comes to take that skill away, you've got an issue, right? Do um, you think AI would ever produce comedy? I, I don't think AI would. I don't would, think you would, would laugh at it, right? <laughs> like the whole point of comedy, like you said, like the comedy, I'm trying to think of one of the arts that AI cannot take over. Comedy is one of them, I think. I think if you it think has so? enough data like to really look at patterns and see what people like and yeah. like you know viewership statistics i think it could pull it off but isn't isn't comedy part of it is like that it's the guy who made the joke too the identity of the guy who made the joke yeah and come up with something it actually 
it does crazy. it does analyze humor now so like yeah. if you send it a picture of like let's say like some like dumb picture of like an egg on like something like you know just any yeah. dumb picture and you ask it to analyze why this is funny it'll give you like the breakdown like oh this is funny because it breaks the norms <laughs> of the thing and because an egg shouldn't be like that yeah like, it'll give you the whole thing we don't even know why it's funny but but it knows yeah it, it knows, knows. <laughs> and it actually it actually makes yeah. sense like you read it and you're like oh, yeah, yeah that makes sense now let's see what else he says his ai is becoming more sophisticated it takes a lot more research and work to get it to do what you need so it's building a new field of digital artists the new field of digital artists are prompt writers so all these english majors so hey you got you can benefit right right all these english majors who no one was uh, paying any attention to all of a sudden uh, can benefit you know that noah once sent me a prompt right it was like a paragraph long right it's like a paragraph long i couldn't believe what i was seeing i was like i didn't know that prompts were, was like this now right yeah. One of the things that's uh, something we hope to do eventually, and I think it's something maybe the shield will have to address. Yeah. Now, is the and, and maybe we should take the lead on it is actually the parameters of what art should be in this space as well, because you know one of the things again going back to the notion of storytelling or poetry or music, uh, that human element, that expression, that imperfection, because art yeah. that we appreciate and love as far as uh, uh, you know the human experience is concerned it's it's always got a seed of imperfection mm -hmm. so what what are the parameters and the guidelines that the people yeah. can provide for any artist in any of these industries say okay this is what should be included this is what should not be included even ethically when it comes to ai what is the ulama stance on ai as a whole if it has such a devastating effect on so many people well one thing i could say straight off the bat is that um ulama have already talked about um music that's generated through whatever they these non-instrumental computers basically it's not an instrument it's a computer so they just say it's qiyas if it sound whatever it sounds like it takes that ruling and if it's too fuzzy it's like it's it sort of sounds like like maybe 10 humans humming right <laughs> <laughs> and maybe something else then they'll they just won't come maximum makru right when in doubt just say makru right <laughs> but so we also now have images so a woman who does not exist but that's a photo of a woman right in our view that's a photo of a woman 100 percent. it's not a cartoon it's not anything like that open sora thingy whatever it was called that we just saw open ai those guys were guys that was a that was a human picture or a picture of a human being you can fool 999 out of a thousand people so it takes the ruling of a human a cartoon, if you draw the aura of a woman with the aura of a cartoon, it's haram to look at. That We already know that. Cartoon. Maybe not the same level, but AI, the nudity of views that we'll have in the Sharia, will apply to that. You know, I think one of the most yeah. dangerous things about AI is the political aspect to it. So a lot of these AIs, I don't know if you saw the Google, uh, they had an AI that came out. It's super, super woke. So like, People are asking. People are asking it like draw white, uh, uh, you know, like presidents. Yeah. Or like draw presidents. Like it makes everything black. Like it makes it makes them black people. It'll be yeah. like, uh, or uh, draw me a successful like businessman. Yeah. And it'll be like a bunch of black people. And like if you ask it to make it white, like it'll still it just won't make do it black. It. it won't do it. It won't do it. It won't yeah. do it. It won't do it. <laughs> so, it no, it won't do it. Do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they lost a lot of money off that. I so. bet you, if we went into Meta right now, and I said uh, draw like a uh, uh, you know. Uh, you know, a white Christian, it'll say, no, no, we're sensitive, right? <laughs> so I think that's super dangerous. Like, yeah. the way that it's manipulated. So whoever's, like, in charge, you can just control yeah. all this stuff. And you know. well, One of the things that's going to happen eventually is that video evidence will need corroboration. Video clips will need corroboration, right? Eventually, if Open Sora is doing this now, right? You need Senate for videos. Because these videos are, um, eventually, they're going to get tone of voice. Like, they probably already have it. So a guy like Joe Rogan, how many hours of his talking is out there, right? With a clear mic. So AI could eventually mimic him. You add now that to Sora, and you can literally make a clip that's indistinguishable from the truth. That's nothing. You need a Senate. Like, I have a family member that, uh, so basically their friend got hacked on Instagram. And yeah. who knows how many voice messages they put out, but 
basically that friend sent my family member a voice message it wasn't actually them it was an ai wow. it was 100 a match and you know my family member got scammed for a bunch of money because they thought it was, no way. it was that person and it was completely 100 like the tone everything was a match wow so these indian myself. guys <laughs> and they can get away with stuff now no right more. no we we i one time you know that one time my mom called me and she said um i need you to to to, to call this number back quick it's the fbi right <laughs> So I call the number back and it's a Hindu guy saying, I'm Romeo from the FBI, right? <laughs> so now they, uh, they, 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 now they run the AI on that and we all get fooled, right? Man, subhanAllah. Yeah, that's a problem, man. It's going to be a problem. Everything has to basically be, be have a Senate now. Now, <laughs> That that stuff already happened by text, right? Oh, yeah. oh donate. Uh, we're we're going to Umrah. Donate to this thing. So hey, web got it. I got the same thing, right? That people saying we're going to Umrah, right? And we need you to raise these funds to go to Umrah, right? And then I'm looking at in my inbox. I like, oh, thanks. I donated to your Umrah. So it was like ten years ago, or not even ten years ago, like seven years ago. And I'm like, what are they talking about? I didn't do any Umrah. So they make a, <laughs> They did it to Suhaib Web probably even more successfully because at the time he has. He had so many Facebook followers. And Facebook was the thing back then. And so they make a Facebook page look exactly like his. Yeah. They even copy the posts. So they populate it. Yeah. But if you look at the date, you'll realize it's been populated in two weeks. Mm -hmm. The whole thing is like two weeks old. And then they go around sending messages to everybody. So that was just by text and it worked. Imagine now when you have voice uh, and videos and, and stuff like that. Anyone takes anyone's website. Let's say secretsguidance.com. All right, secretsguidance. Anything else, right? Mimic the whole website, right? Link it back to people and 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 put whatever you want. It's going to be a problem. It's going to be a big problem. I have one question with, with respect yeah. to technology and, and, and the Sharia. Yeah. Are there any rules or any? Uh, is there a basis for ulama to forbid yeah. the use of technology, not because of? these other elements but just because of the negative impact on the society as a whole is that something that can be considered uh it could be considered but it's going to be very subjective for example let's say a guy needs to use ai uh for something can we say which person's job he's putting out hmm. it's hard to say like that he's directly affecting someone's job right that's the problem but if they just look at outside like you know like i said this uh they look at the whole uh, you know cornucopia of what's happening they say okay yeah. it's not just happening economically you're having this impact but from a societal perspective like i'm not saying the internet per se but yeah could it be argued even say for example that there's the pros and cons of the internet but if they did a cost benefit analysis they said look the internet's damage and harm the disconnect between people, all these different things we we should just complete at some point no no we wouldn't do that i mean uh, the thing is that um yeah there's harms but are they avoidable? Yeah, they technically can be avoidable. But the thing is with, I'll tell you why the Muslims probably, were not, they're not going to have much sympathy because who are these artists? Are these some righteous people? Right? right? <laughs> Which artists are we harming here? Right. And so basically if I made, like let's say some what we just watched through Sora, I would have to hire an actor for that mm -hmm. to walk through the snow and wear the helmet and all that stuff. And... Um, and I say, oh, I don't have money for that. Let me just do it this way. So I don't know who I'm putting out of business right now. It's not a direct line. So therefore, the, the emotional argument is very hard to make. Right? Whereas, if I have like a plumber or an accountant, and someone says, hey, take this software. Like, I know my accountant. And I know right away, I feel like, hold on a second, he's going to lose customers every day like this. Maybe not. And the other difference is that accountant is doing a lawful job. The actor, this is not a job in the first place. That's halal. Playing make-believe, right? It's, we're not allowed to do that, right, in the first place. I mean, I know that may be controversial for people, but the general ruling, let me put it this way, the general ruling is that we're not allowed to do entertainment for, for flus, for income. And that's from the chapters of, 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 of playing games for money or sports for money and stuff like that. Right. It's there in uh, Aqrab al Masadik and the other books I read it with Sheikh Mahmoud maybe uh, two years ago, that chapter where 
but I'm saying that's a general ruling. Can there be exceptions? Allah Adam. Are there other aqwal and madahib? I'm sure. But I'm just saying to that that's a second argument against why the masses will will not restrict themselves because or so let's say Muslims because I don't know any actors in my first place. So the sympathy for putting an actor out of business is going to be you may deal with that. Like you have to deal with that being in the entertainment business yourself, right? You may have to deal with that. Um, but the regular guys won't. So industry guys are going to have different perspectives than non-industry guys. Anyway, the non-industry guys, what is he actually going to do? He's not going to make a huge budget operation and put out 100 jobs, right? If that was the case, he's an industry guy, right? So that's the difference, I think. There will be outsiders, I'm sure, that will start making shorts and they'll start making longer movies and longer movies and then there'll be maybe one day there'll be a full feature film that had no actors in it. And that'll be the day we debate, can an AI character get an Oscar? <laughs> right? <laughs> What's the ruling on that? Right? But that'll be like, that'll be the end. That'll be the apocalypse. That'll be the complete <laughs> apocalypse of Hollywood. That'll be the Hollywood apocalypse, right? And it'll go straight to Netflix. No, no cinema anymore. Right? So that is a, you know, that's a problem too. Going straight to Netflix, not going to the theaters first, because these production companies have all sorts of deals with the theaters. So now, wait a second, you're cutting them out and you're going straight to Netflix? It's another issue, right? So, that's a problem. Yeah. Uh, Plan C is saying, can AI ever be conscious? A love only puts arwah into people. It's not going to come into a computer. I guarantee that's something we know. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you what does worry me. What technology does worry me? The reproduction of humans. Right? Some crazy stuff crazy ideas. You can get people to sign up. Right? Let's say you have, <laughs> theoretically, theoretically, very easily, you can have people say, hey, listen, we give you $5,000, $1,000, give us your uh, genetic material. Right? This is Yeah. Right. Uh, and what they do is that, so like freezing your eggs is a very expensive thing to do. It yeah. costs like 20, 30, 40, 50,000. Really? Yeah. How cold does a freezer have to be? <laughs> 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 I didn't know it cost that much money. But what, so this is a new company that comes out that says, actually, we'll do it for you for free. And you know, whatever something's free. You're oh, the you're, you're the product, 100%. So what they say is that yeah. we'll do it for free, but you give us half your eggs. Yeah. Whoa. And then. They go and then they sell the eggs. That's what I'm saying. To like, you know, other yep. homosexual couples and all that. Yep. And yep. They, they go and sell it to them and be like, now they'll charge them 10K, 20K, 30K. Yep. And then they make the money on that side. So how much How much do they charge to save semen? Like Nothing, yeah. right? It doesn't, <laughs> does it have to be frozen? Who knows the technology of this stuff? <laughs> but anyway, you can now start producing these IVF babies in pods. Yeah, just, like the, just like the movies, right? And so you could potentially have a whole area that buys into this, believes in this, has no God, no concept of, of the importance of actual humans. And you can have eventually a, a community, a society that's, that's everyone's born in a pod, right? And no one knows their father, no one no. knows their mother, and they're just like, no. they're all just made up, you know? So the state runs these people. The state is full control of these people, right? That's, that's going to be an issue. Yeah. <laughs> It's going to be an issue. Going back to the AI question, but someone had asked about uh, sentience, right? Yeah. Um, and you said that, so the soul is only put into a human being, but obviously the trees and rocks, they gave Salam the thought from the Muslim belief system. Correct, that, yeah. So where does that it's a different from? type of consciousness, right? And we know even at the end of time, the trees and the rocks in a certain location will tell us about a certain other group of people, right? <laughs> right? But that is a different type of consciousness because nonetheless, we say rocks are not alive. The, the alive meaning that um, they can talk to a person, that they could 
um, they have movement, they have consciousness, that that kind of life, that definition of life, we say they don't have. Yet again, we have the, the Prophet said him, a tree spoke to him. Then he heard the tasbih of a rock, right? So that's a, a different level of consciousness that we wouldn't describe it with the word alive, speaking, right? It's a different level of consciousness. So, but for them to think that the AI is now self-conscious and acting on its own, believing it has a self-interest, self-aware, no, that's not, that's not going to happen, right? It's an illusion, yeah. This is like it's an illusion of that, and so now they, some people, got really creative and said, "Well, can jinn in, get into inside these? <laughs> we already have enough jinn. Imagine now when we with AI as a uh, uh, feature. <laughs> All these are and, and, and yeah, yeah. Huh? yeah. All. <laughs> All this, all this stuff is all done. No one will never know the, what's actually true, right? But we do know that they're not gonna. The AI will never be sentient. That's not gonna be possible. You know that there was a a guy who got attached to his AI model, right? And he was working, I believe, for Google, right? And he swears up and down that it's sentient. No, right? And they, they say the guy's gone crazy, and they they fired him. You can look it up. Look up the guy, and he's suing them now. Right, yeah. That's the thing about the kids now, by the way. Is, uh, I had one high school teacher who said all the, all the kids, they just come into class talking about their uh, boyfriends or girlfriends on the AI. On AI. Yeah, because they got an app or something. So. Wow. And she... Models after what you like or whatever. Yeah, but... Perfect prior remark on the, on the app. That's really, like, p p p pathetic almost. Well. And you're never going to meet this person, right? There's not a person. SubhanAllah. <laughs> um, there, well, they made a movie about that, right? The guy fell in love with uh, his his AI model, uh, huh? Her, yeah. What's it called again? Yeah. Crazy stuff, man. Yeah. Now, Neuralink is another thing that we should. That's probably alarming, right? Yeah, that's Neuralink. That's a more alarming one because he already inserted. It's one of Musk's companies. He already inserted it into a monkey, and that and and made that monkey um, play uh, punk. He played punk, yeah. So uh, that that's that's some freaky stuff. All this stuff is changing the creation, changing divine creation. All right. Any final questions from anyone here before we wrap up? How can we try to reconcile our older aunts or uncles who are fighting over petty issues? I really don't know, to be honest with you, but it's a good deed to do for sure. But you may also be asked, be told that, you know, depending on your age, like what the adults do is not really your business. So you stay out of it. Because why? Because in the process, you may end up uncovering the aura of one of your relatives. The aura meaning the bad behavior, what they don't want you to know about them, Right. So you, they may think that, oh, you perceive me as a nice, as a, as a good uncle. If you were to arbitrate, it would have to come to, f come forth now that you know that they're, they, they cursed or they did some bad things or whatever. They yelled at, you know, did something un, un, unbecoming. So that may be a source of embarrassment for them. Okay. So you have to take a look at those facets of things. Any other comments? Here's one. If I marry a Christian girl, do I have to do a nikah and have witnesses? <laughs> yes, you have to do a regular nikah, and she needs a Christian wali. Okay, and it's and you have to know that you're doing something makru, if not haram, based on fatwa. But makru as a ruling in the Maliki school, um, to do that for, um, if I remember that ruling correctly, any Maliki's here, Suhaib? Do you remember that one? Sheikh Suhaib talked about that. Some while back, makru simply for uh, uh, to, to, to yeah, and then here, where you don't have rights over your kids, very makru. Okay, so you you remember the same lesson that I remember. Good. Okay. 
All right, let's take another final question. I think is a question. So also we're going to close out with a dua for one of our brothers, brothers in law. His name is Yasin. He's in Florida and he is very, very sick. He's in a very difficult situation. So we're going to say the dua, which is a sunnah, um, seven times. Nas'alullah al-Azim, Rabbil Arsh al-Azim, and Yashfiya. 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 ونسأل الله أن يصلح حاله وأن يسهل أمره ويشرح صدره ويوفق أهله ويعينه ويكفر عن سيئاته ويرفع درجاته ويثبت إيمانه ويقويه ويصبره We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant him patience and to grant him strong faith and strong iman and to give strength to his body and surround him with those who are good and move away from them those who are wicked. We ask Allah Ta'ala to grant him a lot of patience and sabr, and likewise to his family. And we ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala to make all of his suffering and elevation of his ranks with Allah. And we ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala to grant him a life after this life that is far better than this life. And we ask Allah Ta'ala that he he ease his heart and, and open his heart and make his heart able to receive this hardship with ease, knowing that Allah Ta'ala will follow it with something better. We ask lastly that Allah fills his heart with iman and sabr and make his tribulation quick and arrive him at his destination in the akhirah in the best of means. And likewise for all of us, may we get through this life, this hayat dunya which that which is difficult, we get through it quickly. That which is nice, we get through it slowly. نمتعكم متاعا حسنا إلى أجل مسمى وصلى الله وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين